Jacob Fatu's apology for his charity controversy, a rumour about Becky Lynch's WWE dispute, my review of Monday Night Raw, and more. I'm Ollie Davis, and this is the Wrestle Talk News. Support Wrestle Talk! Get exclusive bonus videos over at patreon.com forward slash wrestle talk. Before Jacob Fatu debuted on WWE TV, there was reported concern over how he would fit into the Bloodline storyline. Even though he is a real life Anoa'i family member, there was fear he would actually be too good, where he'd overshadow WWE's new tribal chief push, Solo Sokoa. I'd like to say bullet dodge there, but it's kind of exactly what happened. But there was another concern hanging over Fatu before he joined the company. An incident from 2023 where he allegedly took money from a charity. This was for a wrestling show that was raising money for the charity Jake's Network of Hope. The non-profit paid Fatu $2,633 for his appearance, plane tickets and hotel accommodation, but he cancelled on the day of the show, citing a family emergency. Jimmy had probably just turned on Jay or something. The charity was understanding and asked that Fatu pay back his appearance fee, but he allegedly didn't. A Reddit user claiming to have worked for the charity then alleged they had found out the reason Fatu cancelled his appearance was a lie, and that he had done this to multiple other promotions, not charities. Also in that post, the charity worker reveals 90s WWF star Tatanka hit on his fiance. Go get him, Tatanka. The story was even aired on an NBC station. The, the Fatu charity thing, not Tatanka, hitting on fiancés, but it got lost in the news cycle. Until now. A new Reddit post asking whether Fatu ever paid back the money gained traction over the last few days, where the original poster alleged, no, unfortunately, he did not pay back the charity. The charity themselves then responded to Sports Illustrated with an update. Jacob Fatu and our organization are addressing this matter privately, beginning with a phone call and heartfelt apology back in May. While the full amount owed hasn't yet been repaid, we appreciated Jacob's acknowledgement. It can be tough to face up to your wrongdoings, and we commend him for taking steps toward confronting his. So, Jacob Fatu still hasn't fully repaid the charity after first reaching out five months ago. Fatu making contact back in May would have also been a month before his main roster debut on June 21st, perhaps meaning he felt he needed to smooth things out before more mainstream attention was on him. Thankfully, any Becky Lynch controversy can be more easily resolved. Former WWE talent Jonathan Coachman has claimed on his backstage pass show that Lynch asked for over $2 million per year for a new contract, which WWE didn't agree to. This is why Becky has been away from WWE reportedly without a contract since May. Fightful Select have multiple sources who have shot down this rumour though, reporting that Becky and WWE are still on good terms, and they respect her decision to take time off. Also, apparently WWE would have jumped at the chance to pay Becky $2 million because she's likely on much more than that based on the rest of the roster's pay scale. Which I'm pretty sure is just a fancy backstage report way of saying. Becky Lynch to AEW confirmed. Over in AEW, the Wrestling Observer is reporting the Young Bucks aren't scheduled to be at full gear and could be gone up until January. The idea, apparently, is for John Moxley's faction to cause so much chaos, the Bucks will return to save AEW as babyfaces. And joining them could be... Kenny Omega, who appeared at New Japan's Power Struggle show hoping to wrestle at January 5th's Wrestle Dynasty event, to then have a brawl with Gabe Kidd backstage. The Wrestling Observer have reported AEW's plan for Kenny is to face Kazuchika Okada, so some elite shuffling might have to go on, have the butts split from Okada to join Omega, and forming a faction to take on Moxley's. Speaking of factions, the Mustache Men grow stronger every day. Thank you so much to all of you who've donated so far. Links in the video description below. Remember, if you send us proof of your donation and a photo of your own moustache to support at WrestleTalk.com, we will give you your own moustache break on the WrestleTalk News. But now it's time to break someone else. To finally give Luke Owen a moustache, which you most definitely haven't already seen when he had to do a breaking news video on Friday night because of all those WWE releases. No! This is absolutely the first time you've seen Luke have a moustache. Now get him. Deputy, gonna do the news. Time to get the news done. What wrestling news is there?
hear the music, I can hear a mustache. It's here. It's in the room! There is... Get away! Get away from me! No! Get away! Oh. Oh. <laughs> the Wrestle Talk News just got 93% sexier. And the Wrestle Talk Podcast. Watch Luke and I do our full review of Raw over there later today. But for now, here's my review of Monday Night Raw in about five minutes. Coming from Riyadh, Canada, this episode of Raw was hosted by SmackDown's announced team of Michael Cole and Corey Graves. Thankfully not because being stuck in the country due to mechanical issues. It was just pre-planned logistics, being filmed the night after Crown Jewel. After Judgment Day was shown arriving backstage with Dominic Mysterio holding the cute little ginger cat that Liv Morgan adopted. How's that a heel move, by the way? Damien Priest should be entering with like an arm full of puppies. Calm down, Jerry Lawler! Morgan started the show proper with an in-ring promo. She's taken out Rhea Ripley for months, which is sadly a legitimate injury, but there is a silver lining. It's forced WWE to do something other than Ripley versus Morgan for the fifth month in a row. Speaking of things that have been going on way too long... Maybe just break up a tag team once in a while, Levesque segue. The women's tag team champions Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair interrupted to challenge Liv and Raquel to a fight. Morgan fired back saying the tag belts are the only things keeping Cargill and Belair together and that Bianca will stab Jade in the back. By this time, Adam Pearce had come out, not selling the RKO he took it all two nights before, announcing a battle royal right now, players, to decide the new women's title number one container. Cargill and Belair are long overdue showing actual tension. They've occasionally miscommunicated or, you know, botched, but really they've been totally on the same page all the time. So now was the time where the Battle Royal stipulation will eventually come down to one or the other to actually do something interesting. And Triple H saw that opportunity and played it safe. The Battle Royal came down to the power buff girls Eo Sky and Lyra Valkyria, who was only there so Sky didn't have to eliminate her own tag partner in the end to win. Cargill and Belair going face to face was teased, but only in a dumb, I guess we've got to do this kind of way. And Liv and Raquel pulled them over the top rope to eliminate them before anything could actually happen. Sky then won with a crazy high angle German onto Lyra, onto the apron, and remained screaming in her bridge in celebration. At least we'll get some Eo singles matches out of this. The New Day is a much better example of a slowly breaking up tag team storyline. Xavier Woods had gotten a rematch with the War Raiders after Chad Gable interfered last week, but Kofi Kingston disagreed that was the only reason the New Day lost. It was also because Woods didn't listen to Kofi. The actual match had more of the same. Kofi was on a fiery hot tag run, but just as Kingston was about to hit the trouble in paradise, Xavier tagged himself in. Yeah, that is a heel thing to do, but when a team is totally in sync, that spot can also be Great tag wrestling. Your partner tags themselves in while you hit your finisher, lining them up to hit theirs right after, get the pin while you defend it. But because Kofi and Woods just aren't on that same page, the blind tag caused a flash of resentment. And that brief lapse in focus let the War Raiders get the win. Another great chapter in one of the best WWE storylines of the year. Maybe the potential brother turning on brother could make them a future target for the Wyatt Six. But before that, Uncle Howdy! Oh yeah, he's gonna murder The Miz! Interrupting the New Day's backstage interview, a VHS tape played of Bo Dallas interrogating Miz tied to a chair, who they kidnapped at the end of last week's show. He revealed they never cared about the Final Testament, they only ever wanted The Miz, flashing up a clip from 2018 where The Miz told Bo and Curtis Axel he was going to make them stars. Son of a bitch, long-term booking. Howdy said he would return Miz to the dust, and in a genuinely scary ending, Dexter Loomis, I think, appeared running out of the darkness to seemingly break Miz's neck. Yep, he's, uh, he's dead. The, the Miz is dead. The best part of the whole show, though, was Sami Zayn being back in the Bloodline saga. It's crazy to think that a ginger guy from Canada is what can really elevate the Samoan family soap opera to the best it can be. After speaking Arabic to the Saudi crowd, I'm Carlito. No, Carlito, don't make a racist joke. Jay Uso came out to thank him for saving, but 100% no cap. 
was Sammy's boot to Roman really an accident? An important question, but not as important as why were you secretly talking to Solo Sakura at the end of last week's Raw? I was left unresolved. Jimmy came out to accuse Sammy of doing it on purpose and that he can't be trusted, to which Sammy fired back, asking, what about Jimmy's track record? He's literally turned on everyone here, even Roman. But he admitted that when they were all together again, it felt like old times, it felt special, but he just can't put himself through that again. Jay begged him to talk this out as a family on SmackDown. Jimmy said Sammy isn't family, but to awesomely close the segment, Jay said he is. He's Sammy Uso. Dragon Lee beat Chad Gable in a really good match, thanks to Rey Mysterio helping Zelina Vega after she was attacked by Ivy Nile on the outside. While this is likely building to a Rey vs Chad payoff, they'll struggle to have as spectacular match as these two. Gunther seemed annoyed with Ludwig Kaiser backstage for not handling Sheamus, saying they both have to do better after his loss to Cody too. And the main event was our fatal four-way number one containership match between Damian Priest, Seth Rollins, Dominic Mysterio and Sheamus, presented by The Rock's new Christmas movie, Red One! Because while Dwayne can feature on the Red One poster, he's nowhere to be seen on the WrestleMania one. This was your typical four-way fun, with everyone working together well and getting their chances to shine. I kind of felt like Sheamus was the most over. But then Bronson Reed interfered. Brilliantly, not just attacking the guy he's feuding with, Seth, but fitting with his chaotic lack of focus from the last few months, he just destroyed everyone, heading Death Valley drivers and tsunamis on both Priest and Sheamus, and then putting Seth through a table outside too. Throughout all of this, Dom was hiding, letting him sneak into the ring to pin Sheamus. There was a chance to do something funny and crazy, to book Dominic against Gunther in a World Heavyweight Championship match, and Triple H considered that opportunity and again went for the safe option. Priest broke up the pin and countered Dom's splash into a self of heaven for the win. This was one of the best two hour Raws so far at 71%. But Raw might not look this way for long, because a draft could be shaking up the rosters ahead of the Netflix debut. Click the video on screen now to find out more.